Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about parametric equations. Up until this point, whenever we've looked at graphing an equation or a function, we've thought in terms of input and output. If we put in x for this, what will y come out to be, right? We plug in x at 10, y is going to be some number. We plug in x at 2, y is going to be some number. We always think of x going in, y coming out. And that's how we graph it, right? We've got the x-axis and the y-axis, so we plug in this x and that goes to a y. We plug in this x, that goes to a y. We plug in this x, it goes to a different y. And that's how we thought of graphing so far. Parametric equations are a new way to look at graphing. Instead of graphing input versus output, we'll base both x and y on a third new variable, a parameter. Parametric equations give us a great new way to look at how time or some other change in quantity, some changing parameter, some outside thing, affects an object, such as letting us look at motion over time. There's lots of other uses, but motion over time is a really commonly used one. This way of graphing has a variety of applications in science, calculus, and advanced math. So let's look at what it is. Using this new idea for graphing, we can describe a set of points in the plane, a graph as a plane curve. So as opposed to thinking of a graph as the x going to y's, we can now just think of it as a bunch of points on the plane. So how do we get those bunch of points that we call a plane curve onto the plane? A plane curve is created by two functions, a function f of t and g of t, that are defined on some interval of the real numbers. So t is allowed to go from some set of numbers, you know, has some set of numbers like say 0 up until 10. And the curve is the set of points x comma y equal to f of t comma g of t. That is, as you plug in all the various t's that we're allowed to have, it creates a bunch of points on the graph and that's our curve. That's what we get there. The equations x equals f of t and y equals g of t are called parametric equations and t is the parameter. While we use t most often for parametric equations, since they usually involve time, t for time, we can use any symbol. So we could use whatever symbol made sense for the specific parametric equations we were working with. You might see theta show up, or it might be some other letter, depending on what we're working with. The key idea of a parametric graph, parametric graph, is that instead of having x and y be based on each other, we base them on some outside parameter. So, for example, as time goes on, how does the object move in the x and the y? So as this outside thing goes forward or goes to negative values, either, you know, as this outside thing changes around, how will x and y be affected by this outside thing changing? x and y are no longer directly linked, they're linked to a parameter, and how is that parameter changing affecting x and y. So how do we graph parametric equations? Graphing a parametric equation is very similar to what we think of as normal graphing. You plug in a value, then you see what point you get, right? Just instead of plugging in x to get y, like we used to, we now plug in t, and we get x and y. So we plug in one t, and it gives us x comma y out of it. So if we have x equals t plus 1, y equals 2t minus 1, these are our parametric equations. We can just plug in a variety of different t values, then plot the points that come out for those t values, and we'll have a uh, graph. So let's start at 0. We plug in 0, then that would give us the point x is 1, y comes out to be negative 1, right? If we plug in 0 for t, we get 0 plus 1, so 1. 2t, 2t minus 1 for y, so 2 times 0 minus 1 gets us negative 1. So that would come out to be at t equals 0, we have 1 comma negative 1 as a point. So we go and we plot that, 1 comma negative 1. We plot that point. We do the same thing at 1, at time equals 1, we've got 1 plus 1, so 2. And 2 times 1 minus 1 comes out to be 1, so we have the point 2 comma positive 1. So we go and we plot 2 comma 1, and that's on it. And we've already drawn this, so if t is allowed to vary, just have complete varying going over everything, that red line that we see there. But we could just keep plotting points like this. 2, 3, 3, so we would get 2 plus 1 comes out to be 3. 2 times 2 minus 1, 4 minus 1, so 3, we'd get 3 comma 3. If we want negative values of t, right, we aren't required to only have positive values of t. We weren't given any limitations on what t could be, so we have to be allow for t to be anything when we're graphing it. So if we plug in t as negative 1, negative 1 plus 1 comes out to be 0. 
uh, 2 times negative 1 minus 1 comes out to be negative 3. So we've got 0 comma negative 3. So at this point, it becomes pretty clear that we're graphing a line, although this, you know, in this picture specifically, we'd already seen the line. But it would become clear to us that we're graphing a line. And we could graph points in between them as well if we wanted to get an even finer idea of what's going on. But it's pretty obviously a line. Same graph, different equations. It's possible to create the same plane curve with different parametric equations. This is kind of surprising, because we think of the equation changing automatically meaning the graph will change, that our picture, our plane curve will change. On the previous slide, we graphed x equals t plus 1, y equals 2t minus 1. That was what we had on the previous one. On this slide, we have the exact same graph, but these new equations, x equals 3t plus 1, y equals 6t minus 1. But the plane curve, the graph we get off of it, looks exactly the same as the one we just had on the previous slide. How is this possible? What's going on? Let's investigate. So we have x equals t plus 1, y equals 2t minus 1 is our left side, and x equals 3t plus 1, y equals 6t minus 1 is our right side. Both pairs of equations will produce the same plane curve. They'll produce the same set of points for our graph. But there is a difference. The second pair is moving faster. This set of equations here is moving faster in a way. It will move three times as far for the same change in t. So let's try some values here. For our red equations here, if we plug in 0 for t, then we wind up getting 1 comma negative 1, this point right here. If we plug in 1 for t, we'll get 2 comma 1 out of it, this point right here. Compare that to the blue one. If we plugged in 0 in the blue one, we'll have 3 times 0 plus 1, so we'll be at 1 in our x, and then 6 times 0 minus 1, so negative 1. So we'll have the same starting location. At time equals 0, at t equals 0, we'll be at the same place as in the red one. However, when we plug in time equals 1, t equals 1, we wind up getting 3 times 1 plus 1 is 4, and our y value is 6 times 1 minus 1, comes out to be 5. We've managed to go way farther than we did. Look at how much farther the blue graph has gone than the red graph. So the blue graph has managed to go 3 times as far. We'd have to go out to t equals 3 to be able to get the same set of points, right? We'd have 3 plus 1, 4, and y, 2 times 3, 6 minus 1, 5. So if we had plugged in t equals 3, we'd be at the same point, 4 comma 5. So effectively, the blue graph is moving 3 times faster. It does the amount that it takes one time interval in blue, it would take three time intervals in red. So three time intervals in red is one time interval in blue. So that's one way of looking at it. They have the same picture when we just look at it, but if we think about how fast the point is moving in regards to t changing around, they're totally different in regards to that. All right, here's another one to consider. x equals negative t plus 1 and y equals negative 2t minus 1. We get, once again, the exact same graph. So what's going on here? How is this possible? Well, we actually have the same plane curve, but once again, the motion, the tau does t chain show which point we're at, completely different. So at 0, we're at 1 comma negative 1, just like before. However, as we go to positive numbers, if we plug in 1, we get 0 comma negative 3, right? Because negative 1 plus 1 gets us to 0, and then negative 2t minus 1 will get us to negative 3, so we'll be down here. If we plug in positive 2, we'll be at negative 1, negative 5, right? So previously, as t went up, as our t increased, the graph went up to the, you know, went up to the top right. We saw it moving up and it went down to the bottom left as t became negative. But now, if we plug in a negative value, we get 2 comma 1 for plugging in negative 1. So we see that it's the opposite. Negative points go to the top right, but positive points go down to the bottom left. So it's the opposite of what it was before. If we want to show the direction of motion, if we want to show which way it's moving, we can draw arrows along the curve. So in this case, it would be useful to distinguish this graph from the previous one by showing it with arrows. So we just place little arrowheads along the curve occasionally so we can see which way it's pointing. So that's just, you know, two things like that, like the arrowhead just on part of the line. And, you know, we wouldn't make it that large probably unless we're trying to make a point. So we just make little arrowheads so we can see which way motion is going. All right. So 
a way that we can think about a parametric equation, plane curves, all this idea, is we can think of parametric equations as a way to describe the motion of an object. As the object moves, it leaves a glowing trail behind where it moved. So the places it moves through, what we see is the graph. The plane curve is the places it's been through. The glowing trail is the plane curve graphed by the equations. So the equations tell us its motion, its location at a specific time. As it passes through various times, it moves through different locations. And what we see is a graph. What we see is the plane curve is just where it has been. However, this graph can show us where it went. It shows us where it's been. And it can show us the direction of motion by those little arrows along it. But it can't show us the speed. Consider these three graphs. So briefly, real quick, you know, I'm human. I won't make exactly the same graph each of the three times I'm going to draw this. But it will be pretty close. The idea is just that if you drew the exact same graph, we could draw it in three different ways. So in our first one, we draw it like this, right? Fairly slow moving, makes a loop down here, and then goes up like this. So if we saw this as a picture, we'd be able to see its motion, and we'd be able to see where it had gone. But we wouldn't have any idea that it went pretty slowly. But we could have the same thing go through the exact same set of locations, and it would show us the same motion but we'd have no idea that that one went so much faster, right? That red one went so much faster than the blue. My picture isn't exactly the same between the two, but let's pretend it is. So the red one has the same motion, has the same picture as the blue one, but only by having watched it move were we able to see that it went faster. Finally, we could have one that's different than both of those, where it starts off slow, and then it speeds up, and then it slows back down, and then it speeds up, and then it slows back down, and then it speeds up, right? So it's changing around as it goes through it. Once again, my picture's not quite perfect. It's a little bit more jerky than I'd like. But what we're seeing is we can only show where it's been and the direction it went. But once we're looking at, you know, just a still 2D picture, we can't see the speed of motion. So that's the difference in many ways between what we are seeing uh, with the, six, the 3t plus 1, 6t minus 1 versus the first set of equations, parametric equations, was we're just seeing how fast it's going. So they give us the same picture, but the picture isn't quite everything with parametric equations. There's also this question of how fast did it manage to move through that picture. All right. Sometimes it's useful to turn a pair of parametric equations into an old-fashioned rectangular equation. A rectangular equation is just a fancy way to say an equation that only uses x and y, where it's the two things related to each other, like we're used to before in math. To do that, we must eliminate the parameter t from the equation. So how do we go about eliminating parameters from parametric equations? Well, we do this by solving for t in one equation, and then, since we've got t, we know what t is as a value, we can plug it into the other. We plug that into the other, poof, no more parameter, it's gone. So for example, the ones that we've been working with were x equals t plus 1, y equals 2t minus 1. Well, what we do is we'd solve for the t here, and so we get x minus 1 equals t. Not too difficult. At that point, we can take this value for t, and we can plug it in here, so we have x minus 1 takes the spot of the t over here in the y equation. We have y equals 2 times quantity x minus 1 minus 1. We simplify that, and we get y equals 2x minus 3, at which point we have managed to solve this, and we have a rectangular equation. We have eliminated the parameter from it because we no longer have t. So notice, if we were to graph y equals 2x minus 3, it would give us the exact same picture as the x equals t plus 1, y equals 2t minus 1. But because it no longer has the parameter, it no longer has a direction, and it no longer has this idea of speed. So when we turn it into a rectangular equation, it's just a question of what does its graph look like. These ideas of speed and direction, they disappear once we get rid of the parameter, because it's the parameter changing that allows us to have the idea of speed. It's the parameter changing that allows us to have the idea of which way are we moving. Are we moving from left to right? Or are we moving from right to left? I want you to be careful when you're eliminating parameters. You'll sometimes need to alter domains to keep the graph the same. Furthermore, it's not always possible to solve for t directly, so occasionally we'll have to be clever. Sometimes you'll have to come up with an identity or some other relationship that's going on. You won't be able to get this nice, clean t equals something involving a variable, and it'll be something a little bit more you know, thoughtful, a little bit more difficult. So sometimes it'll be as easy as just solve for t, plug into the other one, but other times it'll actually take a little bit of thought and creativity. We'll see a little bit of this in the examples. 
We can also do the reverse of this, where we start off with a rectangular equation and then we want to parameterize it. We want to get a parameter into that so that we can express this rectangular equation instead using parametric equations. This is really easy to do if the original graph is in this form, y equals f of x. That's to say just y is simply a function of x. So pretty much all the things that we're used to of y equals stuff involving x, stuff involving x, stuff involving x, right? If that's the case, you just set x equals t, say x is equal to your parameter t, boom, you're done as easy as that. So for example, if we had y equals x cubed minus 2x plus 3, well x cubed minus 2x plus 3, that's a function of x. X is the only thing that shows up in there, so it's purely a function of X. At that point, we say, all right, let's say X is equal to T. Let's just set X equal to the parameter T. And then T, X, they're the same thing. So we go back here, we swap out T's for X, and we get T cubed minus 2T plus 3 for Y. So at this point, we've got X equals T, Y equals 2, sorry, Y equals T cubed minus 2T plus 3. We've got parametric equations. And it's really, really easy if it's in this nice clean form, y equals f of x. Also, if it was in the form x equals function of y, where it's x equals stuff involving y, then you just set y equals t. You can do the same thing in the other direction. However, it won't always be that easy. Sometimes the original rectangular equation can be a little more complicated where it's got like x squared plus y squared equals 1 or something like that. In those cases, it's going to take more thought. If you want to try to come up with identities or relationships that will help you create the appropriate parametric equations, how can you get these two things to connect to each other in a way where you can bring a parameter to bear? There's no one easy way to do this. It'll depend on the specific thing you're working on. So just try to think of things that look similar or that might be connected to this and just try to sort of play around and use whatever you know to be able to come up with some some way to sort of massage it into something where you can get a parameter to show up, at which point you can easily turn it into parametric equations. But it can require some playing around and cleverness that won't just be immediately apparent. So just think of things that look similar and if there's any way to use them. So parametric equations allow us to make really interesting graphs very easily. And by interesting, I mean things that are wacky, bizarre, cool, strange. They're pretty unlike any other graph we're used to. So let's start with this red one first because it's considerably more tame. So if x is equal to 3 times cosine pi t and y equals t, well as t increases, our y is just going to increase as well. So as t goes up, y goes up. However, as t goes up for 3 times cosine pi t, well at t equals 0, cosine of pi times 0 would be cosine of 0, so 1. So we'd be out here at 3. As cosine, as t goes to 1, we're going to get cosine of pi eventually. So cosine of pi is negative 1, so we'll wind up going out to negative 3. So cosine 3 times cosine pi t is just going to oscillate back and forth. It will wind up oscillating faster than normal cosine of t because it's got this pi factor in there. But other than that, it's just going to wind up oscillating back and forth. So that's why we see this curve as it going as it goes up, it oscillates back and forth. Let me get that so it goes your way, so that's to the left. So it starts out on the right, and then it goes, as it goes up, it sort of bounces back and forth, and we see this oscillation like that. If we want to draw it in, we can see that from these two, or for the first two points that we plot about, it's just going to be going back and forth like this, and we can keep that going down this way as well. All right. There we go. Now let's talk about the blue one. This one's considerably more wacky. x equals t times cosine of 2t, y equals 5 times sine of 3t, and we're restricting t to only go from 0 until 6. So it's not allowed to go to anything. It's 0 until 6. So this starts, if t is 0 for both of them, then we're going to start out at 0, 0, because cosine of 2t, cosine of 0 would be 1, but it's multiplied by 0 times cosine of stuff. So we start out at 0, 0 for the beginning, and then from there we sort of work our way out. So it goes up and around and around some more. Like that. So it's a pretty unusual thing, right? There's no way we'd be able to write that easily with, uh, you know, rectangular coordinates. There's no way we could create a function of that. It clearly fails the function test. But as a parametric equation, creating it parametrically, totally fine, not very difficult to do. We can express this really weird looking figure in very, very few, you know, very little symbols. t times cosine 2t, 5 times sine 3t, t goes from 0 to 6. We can create this really strange looking thing. So parametric equations gives us a lot of power to make really interesting looking stuff without that much difficulty. This brings us to the idea that graphing calculators are nice to have. 
Why? Because working with parametric equations is a great time to use a graphing calculator. It's a totally new way of looking at graphing. Even if you've seen it just a little bit before in previous classes, parametric equations takes a little while to wrap your head around this idea of something that I'm, you're not seeing t on the graph. t doesn't ever show up on the graph. You see it's what its effects are through x and y, but t itself never shows up on the graph. So it's this new way of thinking of if t moved, it would cause how would x to move, how would it cause y to move. So you're thinking in terms of this thing that never shows up. So it's a totally new way of thinking about graphing. So it really helps to just play around. If you have a graphing calculator, just plot random things. Plot down, you know, some equation that you think might be interesting. And then once you have an understanding of an equation, alter that equation if you already understand it and see how can you get it to like, you know, move in some different way. How you can get the whole thing to move up to three. How can you get it to move left by two? How can you get the thing to squish down? What can you do to it to get different stuff to happen? How can you play with the thing? Just do weird stuff to it. Play with your graphing calculator and just get a sense for how parametric equations work. There's pretty much no better way to learn this sort of stuff than just screwing around for a while with it. You just do sort of weird things and eventually you realize, oh, this makes sense. Oh, this all, it'll, it will click eventually, but you have to get experience with it. The easiest way to get experience quickly with graphing things isn't by graphing it by hand. That takes a long time. But if you use a graphing calculator, you can get really the best of both worlds. You can see your graphs quickly, but you can also think about what's going on. If you want more information on graphing calculators, there's an appendix on graphing calculators at the end of the course, so just go check that out. There's a lot more information there if you don't know much about graphing calculators, if you're interested in getting one. Um, even if you don't own one and you know for sure you're not going to buy one, there's lots of free options out there. The very first lesson on graphing calculators, I talk about some of the free options that you can have for ways that you can have the function of a graphing calculator without actually needing to go out and buy one. If you're watching this video right now, there are graphing calculators that you can use for free right now on the internet, and if you just go and you play around for a little while on one of these free things, it's going to help massively for understanding how parametric equations work. There's really nothing better you can do for understanding this stuff than just getting the chance to play around. Also, when you're using a graphing calculator, pay attention to the interval that the parameter is using. Most will only start with t going from 0 to 2 pi or t going from negative 10 to 10, but because the interval is limited at the beginning, it might wind up cutting off some of your graph. So you want to pay attention to what interval does it start off giving your t. Set the interval as you need for whatever you're plotting. If you have absolutely no idea what kind of interval you want, you might want to just start with a really, really big interval like negative 20 to 20 or maybe go crazy like negative 100 to 100, and that will very, very likely catch anything that you'd wind up wanting to graph, but it's going to take your graphing calculator longer to plug through all of that interval than if it had a small interval to work through. So that's something to think about as you're working with a graphing calculator. Also, if you have any, if you don't quite understand how to get a graphing calculator to work with parametric equations, uh, you can check out the lesson on parametric graphing, parametric, and polar stuff um, in the appendix, and we'll talk a little bit more about what's actually going to be involved in getting a calculator to be able to work with graphing a parametric equation. All right, let's look at some examples. First one, graph x equals t squared minus 3, y equals t minus 2, then go on to eliminate the parameter. So first, let's see what this thing graphs out as. So what we do is we make our normal table of values. So we plug in some t values, and that's going to wind up spitting out x values and spitting out y values. So instead of spitting out one value, it now spits out a pair of values, which is our point. So let's consider if we plugged in 0. So if we plugged in 0 into x, 0 squared minus 3, we'd have negative 3. And plug in 0 into y, 0 minus 2 gets us negative 2. If we plug in positive 1 into x, that gets us 1 squared minus 3, so that'll be negative 2. 1 into y, that's 1 minus 2, negative 1. 2, 2 squared minus 3, 4 minus 3, negative 1. 2 minus 2, 0, 3. 3 squared minus 3, 9 minus 3, positive 6. 3 minus 2, positive 1. If we went the other direction, if we plugged in negative 1, negative 1 squared minus 3, positive 1 minus 3 gets us negative 2. Negative 1 minus 2, negative 3. Negative 2 into t squared minus 3. Negative 2 squared becomes positive 4 minus 3 becomes positive 1. Negative 2 minus 2, negative 4. Negative 3 squared is positive 9. 9 minus 3 is positive 6. Negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5. So that gives us a pretty good set to plot. Let's plot this out. Okay, so let's do markings of length 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 1, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three. Okay. So let's start plotting some of these points. So we see at zero, when we plug in time equals zero, so notice, zero is not going to show up at all in our graph, but we plug in at time equals zero, we have the point negative three comma negative two. So we go to negative three, one, two, three, down to one, two, we plot our first point. Let's go to positive one for time, that's negative two comma negative one, so we'll be here. We plug in time equals two, then we're at negative one for x, and whoops, that won't wind up being the case. Let's go back a little bit. Two squared, two squared is four minus three, so that gets us positive one, not negative one. Sorry about that mistake I made a while back there. It makes sense because that matches up to the negative two value up here. Sorry about that. So plug in two, uh, time equals two, we're at one comma zero, zero for our y value. Plug in time equals three, we're at six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and one height. So we could draw on a curve. Let's also think about it a bit. X is basically behaving as a parabola compared to time. So X, the speed of motion in X, our horizontal motion is going to speed up as time increases, right? Because it's got that T squared factor. So it will start at negative three, but as time gets bigger and bigger, it's going to move faster and faster and faster. What about Y? Y on the other hand is T minus two. It's linear, so it just maintains the same constant rate of increase. It never gets faster, never gets slower. So that's why we wind up seeing this top curving out like this, is as it gets, as time increases more and more, our Y value stays the same amount of increase, but our x value moves more and more to the right. So we move faster horizontally, and that's why we're seeing it curve out like that. If we went to the negatives, we plug those one as well in as well. At time equals negative one, we are at negative two comma negative three. At time equals negative two, we are at one comma negative four. At time equals negative three, we are at six comma negative five. So we're gonna wind up seeing the same thing is it's curving out like this. So it basically curves a lot like a parabola. If we want to know which direction, out here at negative three, it's here, and then it, as it goes to larger times, it curves in this way so we can see its direction like this. All right, so now that we have the graph, let's see about eliminating that parameter. So we've got the graph part done. How can we eliminate that parameter? Well, notice we've got y equals t minus two. So if y equals t minus two, then we have y plus two equals t. Nice. So at this point, we can plug that in for x equals t squared minus three. So we've got x equals y plus two, what we're swapping out for our t, and then we just go back to what it had been, squared minus three. So at this point, we've got x equals y plus two squared minus three, which we could expand if we wanted, but that doesn't really help us understand what's going on any better. So that is a fine answer right there. And if you wanted to, if you had to, you could expand y plus two squared minus three, but for my purposes, that actually makes it easier to understand because then it's in our fairly normal form for a uh, sideways parabola, and so we can see that it's been shifted left by that negative three, so it's been shifted left by three, and it has been shifted down by two, because it's got y plus two. So if you're used to reading this sort of stuff, um, uh, used to reading uh, conic cross-sections, cr conics, then you can see that this winds up coming out to make this picture just the same. All right, let's graph x equals two cosine of theta and y equals sine two times theta. So the first thing to do here is to think about where does the interesting stuff happen, right? So theta is our parameter here. So theta is allowed to change freely. So where would we want to start? Where do we want to stop? What points, how often do we need to have points? Well, the really interesting, the absolutely most interesting points to look at on a trig function are zero, pi over two, pi, three pi over two, and 2 pi, right? Those are the absolute most interesting parts to look at on a trig function. So notice though, we've got 2 theta. So 2 theta isn't going to have its most interesting stuff happen at 0 and then pi over 2, because if you plug in pi over 2 into 2 theta, it's going to spit out pi, so we'll have missed the pi over 2. So the most interesting thing for it would be, the first interesting thing for it after 0 would be pi over 4, right? If we have theta equals 0, then we'll have sine of 0. 
If we plug in theta equals pi over 4, then we'll have sine of 2 times pi over 4, so sine of two, pi over 2. So that's a really interesting thing to look at. So we'll start at 0, and then I'll work our way down with pi over, pi over 4 chunks. So we've got theta, x, and y. So we'll plot a bunch of points so we can see what's going on here. So first theta is 0. We plug that into here, into our x, 2 times cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, so we just get 2. Plug 0 into sine of 2 theta, sine of 0 is just 0. So that's our first point. Next up, we want to do pi over 4, because we just talked about how the most interesting things are going to be on the pi over 4 interval. And cosine theta, well, it has to pay attention to how 2 theta's most interesting stuff is. So pi over 4 into 2 cosine theta. Well, 2 cosine of pi over 4, we use a calculator to cut what that is approximately. That comes out to be around 1.41. We plug in pi over 4 into sine of 2 theta. Well, that's going to come out to be sine of pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. Continue on with this process. We plug in pi over 2. Pi over 2 into cosine theta is going to come out as 0. Pi over 2 into sine of 2 theta is going to come out as sine of pi. So we get 0 here as well. Next up, 3 pi over 4. Plug in 3 pi over 4 in for 2 times cosine theta. That's now going to be getting us a negative value. It's going to come out as around negative 1.41. For 3 pi over 4 into 2 theta, that gets us 3 pi over 2. 3 pi over 2 is now on the bottom of the unit circle. So it's pointing down at the bottom of the unit circle. So that gets us a negative 1 in here. Plug in pi. Pi into cosine theta gets us negative 1. 2 times that will be negative 2. Pi sine of 2 pi is just going to come out to be 0. Notice we're starting to see this pattern with how the sine 2 theta is working. Uh, 5 pi over 4, because at this point, sine has managed to make one entire arc of the unit circle, because it's doubled up. It's got 2 theta, so it moves twice as fast. So normally 0 to pi for cosine theta, but sine of 2 theta does double that, because it's 2 theta, so it's already hit one entire wrapper on the unit circle, so we're just going to wind up seeing a full repeat at this point. 5, over, uh, five pi over 4, plug that in for cosine theta, then we are down, slightly negative down, so we wind up being in negative 1.41. 5 pi over 4 times 2 gets us 5 pi over 2, which is equivalent to pi over 2. So we've got sine of pi over 2, 1. Uh, next up, 3 pi over 2. 3 pi over 2 in for cosine, 0. 3 pi over 2 into sine of 2 theta is sine of 3 pi, effectively, which is the same as sine of pi, which is 0. We're repeating there, remember. 7 pi over 4. 7 pi over 4, we plug that in, that comes out to be around 1.41. 7 pi over 4 into sine of 2 theta, that comes out to be negative 1. 7 pi over, well, let's just write it out. So 7 pi over 4 times 2 becomes 7 pi over 2, which is the same thing as 3 pi over 2, because we can subtract by 4 pi over 2, and it will still be the same, because that's just one whole unit circle rotation. So that's the exact same thing, which explains why we get negative 1 out of there. And finally, 2 pi. So now our cosine has managed to make one entire wrap, and it's back to 2, and we're back to 1. So notice, whoops, whoops, not back to 1, we're back to 0. Sine of 4 pi is sine of 2 pi is sine of 0, which is 0, not 1. So at this point, we've managed to make an entire wrap on our cosine theta, entire wrap twice on our, on our sine 2 theta. If we were to keep going up with theta, we just wind up seeing completely repeating values. If we were to have gone down with theta, we'd see repeating going in the other direction. So this is actually enough for us to have. All right, so let's draw some axes here. Okay, let's make a unit of 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 1. So here's 1, 2, 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1. OK. So we plot these points. Let's do just the first three, see if we can understand what's going on there. So the first theta equals 0, we have x at 2 and y at 0. At pi over 4, we have x at around 1.41, so a little bit under halfway to the 1, and then at a height of 1. 
and then at theta equals pi over 2, we managed to get to 0, 0. So let's try to think about what's going on here. 2 times cosine theta. Well, that's just going to be 2 times cosine, uh, sorry, 2 multiplied on cosine theta. Kind of obvious, but cosine theta. How is cosine theta going to move from 0 to pi over 2? Well, that's the question of how does the x change as we spin up to the top, right? So it's going to move faster the closer theta gets to pi over 2, right? That's sort of what we might be used to from how trig things work. So it's going to move faster as it gets closer to being at the top. It'll move a little slower at the first, which is why it hasn't gotten very far by pi over 4, but then it manages to jump all the rest of the way down to 0 by the time it gets to pi over 2, only another pi over 4 forward. What about sine of 2 theta? Well, sine of 2 theta is doubling the speed, so it manages by the time it gets to pi over 4, Pi over 4 for theta has managed to have sine effectively feel like it's going to pi over 2. So it manages to flip up to here and then flip down to here. So sine is a question of how high we are, like this, right? So that's what sine is measuring, is the height of the angle for on the unit circle. So what we wind up seeing is we wind up seeing it go like this. Cuts through and then cuts down like this. So if you wind up having difficulty understanding how in the world we're figuring out that the curve looks like that and it's not just straight lines going together, just try plotting more points, right? Anytime you've got confusion about how to plot something, just plot more points and that will tell you the story of what's going on. If you're not sure how all the curves connect, just plot down more points and the things will start to make sense. Same basic structure is going to go on with the rest of these, so I'll move a little faster now. Next one, 3 pi over 4, at angle 3 pi over 4, we're at negative 1.41, negative 1, and then pi, we're at negative 2 and 0. At 5 pi over 4, we're at negative 1.41 and positive 1. At 3 pi over 2, we're back to 0, 0. At 7 pi over 4, we're at 1.41 and negative 1. And then we're back to 2, 0. And from there, it just wraps. So what we wind up seeing is it does the same sort of curving thing like this. So we get this sort of hourglass figure on its side. Right? It looks kind of like an infinity. And we can see that the direction it's moving, it's moving this way. All right, so anytime you've got one of these and you're really not sure how these things work, worst case scenario, you just plot a bunch of points. Plot really small things for your angle theta. You know, break it into even smaller chunks and just try it. You could always have just plotted in theta equals 0, theta equals 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and just use a calculator to get decimal approximations for your x and y, and then just plot all those, and that will help you see the curve. And then once you get a sense for how the curve is moving, you'll be able to use that to not have to plot as many uh, as many theta values, as many time values for uh, later parts of the curve. So there's you always just plot more points if you're not sure how the curve looks. All right, third example, eliminate the parameter, but make sure the resulting rectangular equation gives the same graph. The hint here is to control the domain of the rectangular equation. So before we try to eliminate this, let's look at what would x equals e to the t, y equals e to the 2t plus 7. What would that look like? It actually looked a lot like a line, surprisingly. Um, actually, no, it won't look a lot like a line. It'll look a lot like a parabola, surprisingly. But there's this sort of strange thing that's going on. Think about what values can e to the t become, right? If you plug in really large values for t, you get huge values out of e to the t. But if you plug in really, really negative values for t, you can only get close to zero, right? e to the negative 100 is 1 divided by e to the 100, which is really, really small, but it's not actually zero. Right? You can never get actually to zero. So that means the range for our x equals e to the t. So the range of this thing is everything from zero, but not including zero, because it can never actually get there up until positive infinity. Similarly, the range for y equals e to the 2t plus 7, well, that plus 7 will always be added on. So the question is, how, much can, how small can e to the 2t get? Once again, it can only get close to 0, can't even actually make it up to 0. So we can only make it up to 7, but can't actually get to 7. So 7, but not including 7, is the bottom of the range. But e to the 2t can become arbitrarily large, so we can get all the way up to positive infinity. With that idea in mind, let's get rid of this parameter. Let's eliminate this parameter. So we know that x equals e to the t. So we can rewrite y equals e to the 2t as e to the t times 2 
plus 7. Still not quite sure how to plug into that, so we can write that as e to the t squared, which we remember from what we learned about exponents. e to the t squared plus 7 equals, at this point we see, x equals e to the t, so we swap out and we've got x squared plus 7, so now we have y equals x squared plus 7. However, what we figured out about range right from the beginning was that x can never get below 0, right? Our x can't actually go more, can't get to 0, can't go more to the left of 0, so we can't actually get to the zero for x. Similarly, the y value can't actually drop below 7. It can't even get quite to 7. So y equals x squared plus 7, that's kind of a problem because while that will never get below 7 for its range, we'll certainly be allowed to put in x values that are different than 0 to infinity. We'll be able to put negative infinity into this, so we have to restrict the domain. So we restrict the domain, and we say the domain for x is going to be from 0 up until infinity. Right? If we allow 0 up until infinity, well then we've satisfied the range that was allowed for x. What our x values are allowed to be is only between 0 and infinity, and we've also satisfied from 7 to infinity, because if we can't ever actually plug in 0 for x squared, y will never come out to be 0 squared plus 7. We'll never actually be able to get y equals 7 out of it, so we'll only get really close to it, which is going to satisfy the range for our y as well, so that also have to have this domain before our answer is truly right. So the eliminated equation, the parameter eliminated, gives us the rectangular equation y equals x squared plus 7, but we have to have this restriction that the domain has to be x going from 0 up until infinity, not including 0. Fourth example, notice that x equals cosine theta, y equals sine theta, gives a circle centered at 0, 0 with radius 1. We won't show this precisely if you're not sure about this. Try graphing it. It's pretty cool. It comes out to be pretty clear if you just go through a few points. So x equals cosine theta, y equals sine theta gives us 0, 0, radius 1. So we wind up getting a circle with radius 1. All right. So let's think about if we wanted to give a parametric equation for a circle centered at 3, negative 2 with radius 5, how could we do each one of those things? Well, we could get, we could move the center by adding things to x and y, right? So if we have x equals cosine theta, y equals sine theta, well, if we just add 3 to x, so it's 3 plus cosine theta, well, then all of our x values will have shifted the entire thing horizontally to the right by 3, right? We'll have shifted the entire thing horizontally because we just added 3 to x, so every x point just moved over 3. So if all of the points move over 3 at once, we've just moved the center 3 horizontally. If we want to move the center vertically, we just add or subtract the amount to our y. So we can move the center by move the center to 3, negative 2 with x equals 3 plus cosine theta y equals negative 2 plus sine theta. And that will give us a circle that is moved over 3 and down 2, and so we'll be down here. If we want to expand to a radius of 5, so if we want to increase our radius, then we're going to wind up just multiplying the x and the y by 5. If we make them bigger by 5 on the whole thing, then that means every point of it just went out by 5, so we can multiply 5 on cosine theta, 5 on sine theta, and we'll wind up have expanded the entire circle by 5. So we can change the radius to 5 by having it be x equals 5 cosine theta, y equals 5 sine theta. And that will wind up giving us a larger circle that now has a radius of 5. Notice, if you wanted to make an ellipse, where instead of having a constant radius everywhere, you wanted to maybe make the radius, the radius, no longer technically a radius, make it smaller on the top, but then expand out and then smaller again, you wanted to have a major axis and a minor axis, you could change 5, you could not use the same number multiplied on your cosine theta and your sine theta, so that one of them will wind up being larger out, and then it will shrink down for the other one. That's one trick if you want to be able to make an ellipsis make an ellipsoid, an ellipse. <laughs> okay, so we take these two ideas and we put them together. So we combine moving the center, we combine expanding the radius out. So now we've got a radius of 5 is 5 cosine theta and 5 sine theta, x and y respectively. So if we want to move that, we just add 3 and negative 2. So we put these two together, ideas together, and we get x equals 3 plus 5 times cosine of theta and y equals negative 2 plus 5 times sine theta. That would wind up getting us 
a circle that starts at 3, negative 2, and has a radius of 5. Cool. All right. One little idea before we get to our very last example, projectile motion. This is a really good use of parametric equations. A projectile that is launched from some starting location, whether that means thrown, shot from an arrow, shot from a gun, thrown out of a catapult, whatever it is, any projectile, anything that's moving, a human cannonball, whatever it is, anything that's moving from some starting location, d comma h, so d is the horizontal location, h is the vertical height, with an initial velocity of v naught, v sub zero, pronounced v naught, like n-a-u-g-h-t, like all for naught, anyway, v naught, so our starting velocity v naught, and an angle of theta above the horizontal, so how much above the horizontal, if we wanted to draw that in here, then this here, would be our angle theta, and this is our v naught. How fast did we start out before gravity started to affect us and pull us back down to the Earth? So we've got these ideas here. Can have its motion described by the parametric equations x equals v naught times cosine theta times t plus d, our starting uh, starting horizontal location, and y equals negative one half g times t squared plus v naught sine theta times t plus height. In the equation for y, we're probably wondering, what is this g? Well, this g is the constant of acceleration for gravity. So on Earth, we have a gravity, an acceleration of gravity of 9.8 meters per second per second. Equivalently, in the imperial system, 32 feet per second per second. So we've got this acceleration. If we went somewhere else, like, say, the moon or Jupiter, we'd wind up getting a different value of g, but most of the problems we wind up ever looking at are on Earth, so you'll probably wind up seeing 9.8 meters per second per second, an awful lot. Let's understand just how this is working. So we've got this initial location they get shot out of. Then this velocity winds up going out, and then gravity pulls the thing down, right? Gravity is always pulling down on the object, and it gets pulled down more and more and more and more and more until eventually it lands and hits the ground. If you take any object and you toss it, right? You toss it up. If you were to carefully graph out the thing that it, what it looked like, if you were to see what it have, you'd see that it has an arc of a parabola. This is true for any thrown object. Any object at all winds up having a parabolic arc to it. And so that's what we're seeing here is we're seeing this parabolic arc as a parametric equation. All right, we're ready for this final example. So we've got a reminder of these formulas on the top. And our problem is a marauding horseback archer fires an arrow at a castle. And he's on a height of two meters because he's on top of a horse. So he fires and he starts at a height of two meters. And the arrow comes out with a speed of 50 meters per second and an angle of 25 degrees above the horizontal. So he starts at a height of two meters, speed of 50 meters per second, and an angle of 25 degrees above the horizontal, all for the arrow. The castle walls are 80 meters away. He's firing at a castle, and the walls of the castle are 80 meters away, and they're 10 meters tall. How far above the wall is the arrow when it flies over? So let's draw a little picture. So we see our man. He's on horseback, but I won't draw the horse. And there's castle walls out here in the distance, right? And so there is a distance of 80 meters between him and them, and the castle walls are 10 meters tall. So he fires an arrow. He fires an arrow, and it flies through the air. And the question we want to know is, just as it gets above this wall, how tall, what's the extra height above that wall? How high is the arrow above the wall? And then it will wind up coming landing on the other side. Hopefully it won't hurt anybody. Well, he is a marauder. OK, so let's see, how can we figure this out? So our first question is, when is the arrow above the wall, right? We've got this great formula here. We can figure out what the height of the arrow is if we know the time, because we know what v naught is. It's 50 meters per second, right? We know v naught equals 50. We know theta equals 25. He fired it at an angle of 25 degrees above the horizontal. We know that its starting height was h equals 2. And we were given g, so that's everything that we need for y except for the time. But we don't know what time it is before it manages to make it over those walls. So what we need to do is we first need to figure out 
when does it make it to the walls? At what point is it at the walls? So x equals v naught cosine theta t plus d. So we know what v naught is. It was 50. We know what theta is. It's 25. We know how far they are. So we know what our x value is going to be. It's 80 meters away. So finally, what is our D? That's the one thing we don't know there, right? So what's the D? Well, let's just say that the horseback rider, where he starts, is zero, right? We might as well make his horizontal location zero. So he starts at zero horizontally. So zero equals x here, and then this is 80 equals x here. So the castle walls are at 80. He starts at zero in terms of horizontal x location. So at this point, we're ready to solve this thing. So in general, we have that x for any horizontal location, x is equal to 50, our initial speed, v naught, times cosine of 25 degrees, times the amount of time that the arrow has flown, plus our initial location. Our initial location was 0. So at this point, we want to solve. So at x equals 80, our time is equal to what? So we plug in 80 equals 50 times cosine of 25 degrees all times time. We divide by 50 times cosine of 25 degrees, so we get t equals 80 over 50 times cosine of 25 degrees. We plug that into a calculator and we get that t is approximately equal to 1.765 seconds. So after 1.765 seconds of flight time, the arrow is now at the horizontal location of the walls. So after 1.765 seconds, we are at the walls. So now we can plug that in and we can figure out once it makes it to the walls horizontally, how high up is it? What is the arrow's height once we are at the walls horizontally? So now we use y. y equals negative 1 half times 9.8, so negative 1 half times 9.8, our acceleration due to gravity, t squared plus v naught, so 50 times sine theta, sine of 25 degrees, all times time, plus our initial starting height, our initial starting height was 2, right, because he fires it from the arrow, fires the arrow standing, he's, you know, on top of a horse, so he's firing it from above the ground, he's not firing it from actually the level of the ground. So we will start working through that, we want to plug in at time equals 1.765 seconds because that's the time that we're interested in knowing the height. So we plug that in here, we plug that in, and we get y equals negative 1 half times 9.8 is negative 4.9 times 1.765 squared plus 50 sine 25 degrees times 1.765 plus 2. Kind of a lot there. But at this point, we can work this all out. We work it out with a calculator, and we get that it is at 24.03 meters high. So the arrow is 24.03 meters high when it gets to the walls. However, that's not our answer. We were asked how far above the walls when it gets to it. So how far above the wall is it? So at this point, we take 24.03 minus the height of the walls is 10 meters tall. So minus 10 will give us the amount that it is above the wall. So that comes out to be 14.03 meters above the castle walls when it flies over them. All right. So that finishes up for parametric equations. The important part is to think about it. It's describing the motion of an object in terms of this time. So try to think about it as how would time change x? How would time change y? Try to think of both of those together, and you'll start to slowly build up a sense of how parametric equations work without even having to graph them. Mainly, experience is a great way to learn how to do these things, but you can really speed up the process of learning and understanding parametric equations by just playing around honestly for five or ten minutes with a graphing calculator. Just playing around, screwing around, plugging in random things things and seeing how one thing affects another thing, how changing one constant causes things to move around. Just playing around for five or ten minutes will help you so much more than trying to do like ten graphing problems. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye!